Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, The Anatomy of a Wild Successful Lead Generation Campaign. I'm Sarah Duffy, Marketing Manager here at Intronus, and I am happy to be moderating today's session. Today, I am joined by Angela Levitt, CEO of Mojo Marketing. Today, Angela will be reviewing real-life case studies of successful digital marketing campaigns for MSPs. Before we get started, let's go over some brief housekeeping. If you have any questions, please submit them in the questions or chat panel to the right of the GoToWebinar screen. At the conclusion of the webinar, you will be prompted to complete a brief survey. Please take a moment to tell us what you think as we are continuously improving the quality and content of our online events. Now, without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to, today, to today's presenter. Take it away, Angela. Thank you, Sarah. I'm really excited to be back with you and to be talking about a really hot topic in marketing, which is lead gen. And really excited to share with you and the audience, you know, some things that we've found and some, uh, yeah, just like exactly what needs to happen in order to generate leads. So really briefly, just want to to do a little bit of intro for those of you who I may not have met in person yet. Um, I started this company, Mojo Marketing, in 2010, but before that, I was the head of marketing at a hosted VoIP provider. Um, so that was kind of my entrance into the, into the space, been in the industry for about 10 years, but in sales and marketing my entire career, um, have been working with you know, more than 150 telecom, IT, cloud services, MSPs, VARs uh, throughout the last decade. And if any of you ever ever attend events like Channel Partners, IT Expo, Comptel, MSP World, and the like, um, it's chance, chances are you may have heard me speaking there. So um, just a little bit about what we do, and that this is just to, to let you know that like we do have this focus in the industry. So. Um, everything that we do is, is focused on helping B2B companies in the cloud telecom IT space uh, build their brands, generate leads, and so we have a lot of data on what works and what doesn't work. And this is just a sampling of some of the companies that we've had the pleasure of working with over the last seven years. So a little bit of Housekeeping for me, um, if you've got any questions, feel free to put them into the questions box that's there on, uh, on the webinar. Happy to stay as long as necessary to answer all of your questions. Um, if you tweet, we encourage you to join the conversation on Twitter with us. Um, uh, my Twitter is MojoMKTG. You can also tag Intronus and use the hashtag LeadGen. Also, more than happy to share these slides with you if, if you think they would prove useful. Um, just send me a note afterwards to my email and if you have any feedback for me as well, like um, always interested in what you have to say and what you liked and what, what you'd like to see next time. So today I'm going to go over two different models for generating leads. Um, the first one I call the fishing model and then I'm going to show you some additions and variations to that model. And the reason we call it fishing is because it's a lot like, you know, trying to trying to figure out like where are fish hanging out and how do we build a net that will capture them and how do we drive to where they are and drop the net and pick them up. <laughs> um, that's, that's the fishing model. And the farming model is another method where it's a, it's a little bit more long term, but it's, it's a very effective model for for building an inbound strategy that will have leads coming into you continuously over time. So I'm going to share both of those methods with you today. So who wants leads? Everybody, right? I mean, I think every conversation that I have with, uh, with anyone who ever reaches out to us almost inevitably starts with how can we generate more leads, right? Nothing, nothing happens in business until there's a sale and there are no sales until there are first leads. So we get it. This is on your minds. This is something that is really important to you as a business um, and probably at the top of your priority list when it comes to marketing. The truth is that the old tricks just don't really work anymore. As I mentioned, you know, I've been in this industry for 10 years, and back in 2007, 
it was really easy. You know, you could buy an email list and send out a few emails and yeah, a couple people might have gotten annoyed by that, but um, but you would inevitably get a, a decent response even if the list was like pretty cold. Um, it was also a newer age with, with things like pay-per-click advertising, or if you if you jumped on the, the SEO bandwagon, if you were early to that game, then you were able to make things happen quickly. I had a conversation about six months ago with the guy that told me that you know, he was one of the first people to get a domain around toll free. And he said within, you know, within two months, he went from two people to 80 people because he was getting all the traffic um, for people wanting toll free numbers, right? Uh, it was a land grab, but that day is, is kind of over, right? So today, people are bombarded, right? We're bombarded with information on, on all sides. There's there's a sea of sameness that exists in our industry. You know, um, how do you tell one MSP from the next? Um, what, what are your differentiation points? Um, the telecom IT industry has a little bit of a, you know, a, a, a bad rap at times. You know, no one wants to deal with the carriers. And so, you know, it's, it's not something people are necessarily excited to talk about. Um, and also, you know, our buying habits have changed to where we really want our network's opinion. And so all of this has kind of accumulated into what Seth Godin calls the the connection economy. And so, you know, according to him, we've moved past the information age. We're now in this connection economy where everything is about trust and relationships. And so a lot of the keys here that we're going to talk about from lead gen have to do with this. Because of this shift, there's been a, a big change in marketing's role in the sales process. So if you look on the left side, this is probably what it looked like about 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, where marketing's job was to, you know, just create some awareness, get some interest, get some people into the funnel. And from there, a salesperson would take over. But what we're finding is that today, more and more people are wanting to guide themselves through the sales process and they're not reaching out to a salesperson until they're at the very final stages of making their decisions. So, so what does this mean from a marketing standpoint? Well, this means that you have to do a, a lot more <laughs> to guide people through that process and make sure that they have the tools to do that self exploration. You know, I recently um, purchased a new car a couple of months ago. And if I would have been purchasing this car, you know, 10 years ago, I probably would have said, okay, um, I know I need a car. Let me drive to a bunch of different dealerships and start test driving. But what I did with this one is I did all my research online. I talked to my social network. I got a really good idea of what I wanted. And when I walked onto the, the dealership's lot, I knew exactly the car, the, you know, the two or three models that I wanted to drive. I, I needed very little information from the salesperson. So that's just one illustration of, of how the buying process has changed and therefore how marketing has changed. So we're going to assume that there's some guiding principles in place here before I get into like the campaigns and how they worked. So number one is that you are a trustworthy brand, okay? No amount of, of campaign uh, activity is going to help you overcome a brand that, um, that is not trustworthy. And so what does this mean? Um, you've got testimonials, you have a solid reputation, and your brand and your design is on point, right? I frequently have conversations with, with people that call me up and say, okay, we're ready to do some lead gen campaigns. And I look at their websites and, and they look like they were built in 1995, right? And so that there's no point in worrying about generating leads and doing campaigns if, if the net that you're trying to catch the fish with has a bunch of gaping holes, <laughs> right? So, so number one is to make sure that, that everything looks really good, functions well, makes you look like you're a company that is forward thinking, moving, shaking, um, current to 2017. So, so let's assume that you're already there. If not, then that is your big homework assignment from this webinar is to, you know, make sure that everything that you have that is public facing looks and sounds good. 
Principle number two is that is that you're a hustler, right? That you're you're out there, you're networking, you're doing things to stay in front of people, you're build, you're actively building relationships. Um, the companies that just kind of sit back and expect like the digital to do 100% of the work for them are typically disappointed with that, right? Because at the end of the day, um, people still want relationships with real people. So make sure that um, that what you're doing digitally is supplementing what you're doing in person and, and just shining a bigger spotlight on it. Okay, so with all that, we're gonna get into the meat of, of the program here. Um, we're constantly doing a lot of testing. We do this for a lot of clients. I'm gonna show you exactly um, what we implemented for one client. I'm not going to go into what, you know who it was and, and all those types of things because of some NDA restrictions, um, but I will show you the numbers from the results so that you can get an idea. So as I mentioned, the, the first one is the phishing method. And so in this method, we're really looking at trying to identify um, where people are and gathering them together and tying them all, all up in a net at one time, right? So, so this is a little bit more of, of I'd say a shorter term strategy um, to implement if you're looking to like get a bunch of leads in the door all at once, okay? So in preparation for this, we also can call this like a launch model. It's, it's like doing a, um, you know, a big campaign launch. There's a couple of steps here. This takes about one to two months of preparation work, just depending on how much, how much content you have at your fingertips. So we're gonna get into that in a second. Two to three weeks of actual execution of the campaign, and then one to two months of follow-up. And so what this starts with, uh, or these are all the elements of the campaign. So I'm gonna go through these one by one, um, but this gives you a, a broad overview. In this case, uh, we did a webinar. As, as an example, so that's the one that, that I'm going to use here. So step number one is to do a little bit of research and to really understand the pain points that your target audience is experiencing today. Um, I just had a conversation about this this morning uh, with, with a client who said, um, hey, you know, we, we really want to push our managed IT services. Like we want to do a lead gen campaign around managed IT services. And I started asking questions and saying, well, what is it, what pain is someone in that causes them to want to invest in managed IT services? And so we, ha we started having this conversation and they started sharing things like, well, you know, maybe their, um, you know, their network is constantly going down or maybe you know, their email has problems, or, you know, maybe they're scared about security. And so those things are going to be much more interesting as potential topics for, for a campaign than simply saying, hey, I want to promote my, my managed IT services, right? So really, I encourage you to really dig deep here and understand, like, what, what is causing people? What's, what's the straw that will break the camel's back that will force, force your target audience to turn to Google or turn to their social network and say, hey, I've got this problem and I need to solve it. And if you can uncover that, then your campaigns are likely to be much more effective. Um, also paying attention to what's hot right now, right? Obviously, ransomware, security, um, all of these things are really hot topics right now. So if you can somehow create a campaign around these topics that are being heavily discussed, you're much more likely to be successful. Um, make sure that you're having these conversations. So ask your customers, your prospects, if you are not the salesperson, talk to your sales team and figure out, you know, what are, what are the conversations that are happening today? And that will be the basis for your campaign. So once we understand the pain points, then we want to develop an offer. And I like to call this a mafia offer because we want it to be so attractive that it's something that they can't refuse. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and, and again, this might, we want to think about directing your, your content here to the pain points and questions of your target audience. Okay, so, so the offer um, in this case that I'm sharing with you, what was a webinar, right? And so the offer was, please attend our webinar 
on X topic. We're going to educate you on A, B, and C, um, and you're going to come away having learned all this wonderful information. Okay, so um, you know, try to think of things that are a little outside the box. Um, free IT audits, free telecom audits, those things are kind of outdated, overplayed. Um, but if you can get a little bit more creative, then you're more likely to have success there. And so now that we have the offer, we're going to develop some content to support it. So um, we'll talk about that on the next slide, what that is. But again, we're really trying to demonstrate that we understand the pain, the questions they have, and we're going to answer them on this webinar. Or it might be an event, or it might be a down, you know, a white paper we want someone to download. Um, whatever it is, like again, we're not being salesy here. We're just giving value, and we're demonstrating we understand, and we can answer these questions for you. And within the, you know, the body of whatever content this is. At the bottom, we'll include an invite. Would you like to learn more about this topic? Please feel free to attend our webinar. And here's some, type, some examples of content that work well for this. So videos, infographics, worksheets, um, even blog posts, case studies. I know whenever, whenever I do a webinar for Intronus, they also ask me to write a blog post about it ahead of the webinar, right? They are using the strategy themselves. <laughs> so, um, you know, in the blog post, at the, when you get to the bottom, there's an invitation. Would you like to learn more about this topic? Attend our webinar. So that's, that's an excellent example of this principle at work. Okay, so we've got some content. We've got our offer. Now we're going to create a landing page. And so this is where we will ask people to sign up. And so some, some companies include an additional content piece as a download. Thank you for signing up for our webinar. Um, in the meantime, here's a checklist of everything you need to know um, for managed IT uh, type things. And also, you know, just make sure that that the registration is very clear. Um, on these landing pages, it's also important to make sure that um, that it's very focused and that there's there's nothing else on the page competing for your attention. So if you have typically a sidebar on your website for internal pages, you might want to take the sidebar off for the landing page. So that really it's just, just the compelling offer, the reasons why someone might want to opt in, um, the opt-in form, and that's it. So very, very simple. From there, we want to have some email autoresponders, right? Um, and this is for not only before the event, or the webinar, but also after, right? So, um, so you might have a couple of reminders going out to your list ahead of time. Um, thank you for signing up. Also, here's some more info for you to help you understand this topic better. But then afterwards, you know, a follow-up sequence so that you can continue to stay in touch with them. And again, the value, the the principle here is that we still want to just offer value, right? Build this relationship through your content, through demonstrating that you're an expert in these, in these topics and that you can answer any questions that the prospect may have. Okay, we've got all that set up. Now we're going to drive traffic to this landing page. Okay, so, so if we're still using the phishing analogy, this landing page is our net. Right? And so now we've got the net, it's out in the water, um, we just have to get fish to swim into it. Right? So, um, so the best way to do this is through some type of strategic partnership where um, you can leverage the relationships that exist there. Um, so this could be a technology partner that you have, a carrier that you work with, someone that is doing some of the promotion on your behalf. Uh, we've, we've done this a lot and just find that if, if both entities are promoting whatever the, the thing is, that there's just a higher chance of success. Plus, if you can have a third party inviting people to come and hear you speak, it makes you look like that much more of an expert, okay? So strategic partners, number one, uh, then we can look at some digital marketing techniques as well. So depending on what it is, you might want to want to try some paid ads. So some some ad Google AdWords through PPC, um, some remarketing, which is 
you know, banners that kind of show up after you've been on the landing page, you definitely want to reach out to your own email database. If there's other lists that you have connection with, for example, um, you know, any newsletters you subscribe to that, that might have a benefit of promoting what it is that you're doing, uh, definitely reach out to them and help get their, their input as well. Um, and social media actually has turned into a really great place to promote these types of things. Um, I believe in the last webinar that, that we helped a client do last month, um, over half of the signups came from the campaigning we were doing through social media, right? And just, you know, making sure that we were really tweaking and tailoring the budget there to show up to the right people. What's cool about this is, you know, if you're doing AdWords on Google, you really only have a choice of, you know, a couple of, of variables there, like the keyword and the location. Whereas if we're running ads on LinkedIn, we can make sure that those ads are only showing up to, you know, IT directors that focus on X industry and are within a radius of X zip code, right? So the, the targeting you can do on the social platforms is much more surgical than what you can do on, on Google. But we recommend, you know, doing a little bit of a test of both there. So, so these are all the different ways we're going to drive traffic to that page. And so at that point, um, you're going to conduct the webinar, right? And so uh, we recommend, you know, that the majority of this be, be educational, right? And that you're really talking to your expertise on the topic. And that if you do have a, a further offer there at the end, um, that that takes up no more than 10% of the time that you're spending with people. Um, I, I was having a conversation yesterday about um, he was actually an IT director and I was trying to dig in to like what, you know, what types of content do you consume, what grabs your attention. Uh, he did mention webinars and said that was one of his favorite ways to learn about the new technologies. But he also said that if the company starts to get salesy, he, he will immediately drop off and that he really just wants to, you know, wants to learn on his own. And so, again, you know, if you can focus your content on addressing that pain, demonstrating authority, then that is going to, you know, be more likely that people will reach out to you afterwards. Okay, so now um, whatever your, your offer is, we're going to want to present it. Um, and there's some, you know, techniques for presenting an offer here. And this is you know, this is one method to do it. And this is assuming that you've got something that's pretty specific. So, um, you know, for our client in question, you know, they had a very specific um, sort of package deal they were looking to, you know, they were promoting out there. And so, you know, they limited it to the first, you know, the first five people to respond. And it was, you know, it, it was a lot of value for a very little amount of money. So, um, you know, that's, they use scarcity and they talked about, um, you know, other clients who had done these similar things. Um, and so these are some techniques. There's also an idea of repeating the offer three times. And so this is not something you do over and over again, like right, <laughs> right in succession, but you want to perhaps um, give the offer and then tell a story and then mention it again and then tell a little bit more of a story or give a testimonial and then present it again. Um, think, about, think about an infomercial and how it's structured, right? Like they don't just present you the offer one time. They know that from a psychological standpoint, it takes repetition for, for us as humans to respond to things. So having that offer in there at the end three times woven into, into that pitch section will make sure that you're a little bit more effective. And then um, another way, if you want even more people to opt in, is to create some sort of, you know, some sort of guarantee. Okay, so so this was the the results of implementing this for for one of our clients. So we had um, we had an industry list of 1,500 um, that the offer went out to. We had a partner list of of 500. So combined list of 2,000. Our email open rates were 23 percent uh which is pretty high um if you know anything about email open rates like typically 
anything over 10% is considered good. So, so good email open rate, um, 64 signups to the webinar, 45 attendees, and eight people that bit on that offer at the end of the webinar that became new customers. So looks like a pretty successful model. Um, what I see when I, when I look at this is the other numbers, right? And so where most companies stop is, is there and they say, okay, well, that was, that was a nice webinar <laughs> or that was a nice campaign on to the next. Um, but there's information here. And so with a list of, of 2000 uh, and a 23% open rate, that means 1500 did not open it, right? So we could do something with that list. Um, if they didn't open it, maybe it was just the subject line. So perhaps we repeat the same campaign to these folks, but just with a different subject line that will hopefully encourage them to open the email. Um, of, the, of the opens, only 64 signed up, 396 didn't. So that means, you know, maybe that wasn't the right offer for them. Um, maybe they're not interested in attending webinars, but they would be interested in watching a video or um, you know downloading a white paper or something like that so try something else um, of the 45 that signed up and the 19 that didn't attend those are really warm leads so let's not forget about them maybe send them a recording of the webinar afterwards right to make sure that they got it um, and of the the eight that purchased and 37 that didn't uh, those 37 are very warm leads very very warm leads so making sure that you have a plan in place to you know, follow up with them and stay in touch with them because maybe for them it's just that the timing isn't right. You know, and they're, they're very interested in what it is that you have to offer, but, it, but not today, okay? So um, what you do next is the very most important part. And so this is kind of what I was just going through, like, okay, the ones that didn't open, we're gonna try an edgier subject line. Um, they, they didn't sign up for the webinar, try a different topic. They didn't attend, send them the slides, um, and they didn't sign up for the offer. Yeah, it could just be at the timing, so we're going to put them in a nurture campaign. So talking about nurture campaigns, there's, there's a couple of ways to do this. Uh, there's the manual way, and there's the more automated way. Um, manual platforms that allow you to do this are low cost, like MailChimp, Constant Contact, Eye Contact, um, and they're lower cost platforms, but they take a little bit more time to manage overall simply because they don't have any automation built into them. Um, on the automated platform side, you can see there's some listed here, uh, Marketo, Pardot, HubSpot, Infusionsoft. Uh, we recently uh, transferred ourselves onto one called Hatchbuck from Infusionsoft. They have a little bit higher cost to set up. Um, you know, they usually run about $200 a month, um, but they allow all of your nurture campaigns to be automated. And so what I mean by that is that if, um, you know, you can set up all these rules automatically where if someone doesn't open X email, they now get pushed into this other campaign with a different subject line, right? Um, or if they opened but they didn't click on the link, then they get, you know, they get a different campaign sent to them. So you can really tailor the experience per user set up previously with all these rules, just push the button and let it happen, right? And so it's very, very tailored email marketing. And something that we recommend, like if you're going to be doing a lot of these types of, of lead gen campaigns. Okay, um, yeah, so why, why marketing automation? Um, it manages the prospects according to their activities. The other really cool thing it does is it gives your leads a score. So it's tracking every single thing they're doing, what they're opening, what they're clicking on, the web pages they're looking at. And the more they're doing, the higher their score goes. And so if you are a salesperson, you find this information incredibly interesting because you can log into your platform, organize your leads by score and say, okay, I am focusing my efforts on you know anyone with a score above 20 right because these people are obviously warmer than people with a score of one or two right and so the, that's just invaluable data for you in your planning in your data and, and just knowing what's working and what's not okay so that that was that portion of the campaign now i'm going to talk to you about a couple of variations on it um, so that you can beef it up if you'd like to to get even more results and so 
Um, what we recommend this for is if you have like really, really high targeted lists, um, hot leads that you're working on, or let's say you, know, you have identified 50 companies that you, you want to get in with and target. Um, so this is something I, I highly encourage marketing and sales teams to work together on this to identify this because you'll see some of the costs of these things are a little higher and so we want to we want to work really hard to make sure that we're we're targeting appropriately so some of the principles that we're going to use here now are we're going to include some more modalities into our approach so when we're digital um, unless we're using unless we're using video we're really only taking into account people's sight right so they're they're looking at they're looking at things and they're reading things and they're opening emails and they're looking at things on social. Here, we're going to incorporate touch and sound as well. So just more modalities in, in ways to reach people. So direct mail is the first one. Um, and believe it or not, it is not dead. Um, it's all in the approach and how direct mail is implemented. Um, I was just talking to someone last week and they were telling me how uh, this company they know of and I thought this was brilliant, and I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test this, um, will send their top prospects a $100 gift card to uh, you know, a top restaurant in, in their area. And it'll be a handwritten note, and it'll say, hey, I just want you to you know, enjoy this restaurant. Hope you have a fantastic time. You know, take, take your husband or wife. Um, and by the way, if you really like it, I'll be back there the following week and you can meet me for dinner there on this date and this time, right? And so, wow, talk about effective direct mail, right? <laughs> um, that, that gift card with the, with the handwritten note is not going to be thrown away by the gatekeeper, right? And so, again, it's, it's all in the how. This happened to me uh, several years ago, um, back when I was at my last company, running marketing, I would get bombarded with people from events and from, uh, you know, publications and promotional items people and just like all kinds, like everybody wanted a piece of our budget. And so I, I was, you know, probably would get like 200 inbound, you know, requests a day. It was so bad. Um, and one day I got a big box in the mail and it was a Rubik's Cube. And um, it was a local printer, and it was really creative, and they had a, a cute note in there um, about, I don't, I don't really recall, but this captured my attention, right? Like, if someone sends you a Rubik's Cube in the mail, um, you're going to notice that, right, versus a postcard. Um, so just some ideas here, you know, and, and again, the reason, the reason why we want to target this to your top 50 or 100 is obviously it's going to cost you a lot more to send a nice restaurant gift card or a Rubik's Cube or, you know, some an object in the mail. So this is why we want to be really targeted. We've found that a, a three-piece sequence works well. So if you can kind of tie the pieces together, um, that, that that's really effective. Um, LinkedIn also. So, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people rely specifically on their, you know, their regular email address. Email is still a great way to reach people. LinkedIn mail is another one. Um, I don't know the, the most recent stats on LinkedIn open rates, but they're incredibly high. Like most people who receive mail on LinkedIn open it. Um, so you can email people that are your connections, but you may not know this. You can also email people that you are in a group with. So this is a little loophole. <laughs> if you want to email, be able to email more people, but they don't, they, you know, you're not connected with them, join more groups or look at the groups that they belong to and join those groups. And then it's most likely you'll be able to email them. The caveat there is that if, um, if they have gone in and deselected that ability, then you won't be able to do that. But most people don't do that. So if you have a common group, you would be able to reach out to them um, and invite them to, you know, to your webinar, to your event, whatever it is. Um, there's also some options to sponsor emails through LinkedIn, and so there's different pricing for that. Um, it is a little bit pricey, but again, you know, LinkedIn's not wanting to turn their platform into into a big spam platform. So you you pay, I think it's about $100 a month to be able to email like 25 people. 
Um, again, their, their open rates are really high, so that might be an effective strategy for you. Okay. Um, and in addition to that, you know, just having, having more content um, to continue the conversation. So, um, you know, you, you might start off with just an infographic and a blog post ahead of your ahead of your offer. Um, but the more content that you have to continue that conversation, um, the more likely you're going to be helping people move themselves through the sales funnel. If remember one of the, one of the slides that we first looked at, the sales funnel is now mostly marketing, right? And people are making their decisions based on what they're able to find online. And so how do we make sure that they're finding your stuff, right? That they're reading your content, that they're educating themselves through you so that you are the one they're building that relationship with. And when they're ready to make that purchase, when they're ready to walk onto the car lot and say, let me take a test drive, it's you that they're thinking of, right? And the way we do this is just through, through more content, more uh, relationship building there. Okay. And the last modality here is to, is to use the phone. And again, um, you know, a lot of people say cold calling is dead. Um, I think that it, it's just a matter of doing it appropriately. And most people are not turned off by a call to invite someone to do something that, that is of interest to them. So again, if, uh, if webinars are your thing, if you do live in-person events, um, and they've received a couple of emails from you following up, with a phone call or two is, is only going to help increase your results there. Um, recommend that you use some scripts and you know, make sure that you're calling a few times. Um, just in the, in the sake of time, I'm going to, I'm going to move through these pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, again, um, keeping it less salesy is like, hey, I want to talk to you about your IT services, more like, hey, I just sent you an email um, inviting you to a webinar, just want to make sure that you got it. Um, or I want to make, I wanted to personally invite you to X thing. Um, and calling a couple of times is great. If you can have more than one person involved in the process, even better. Um, we've found that, you know, if you've got a sort of a tag team type thing going on, um, that the results will go up from there. Um, and yeah, in the sales process, having one person setting up the appointment, the other one doing the close seems to work well. Um, some, some of the best times to place phone calls um, are Wednesdays and Thursdays, um, the worst obviously being Mondays and Fridays, um, and interesting that the, the timing here, so, you know, first thing in the morning or end of the day seems to be the best time. Okay. All right. So, I'm going to spend this next little bit talking about um, the other method, which is the farming method. And so, this one is a little bit more of a long-term strategy. If you think of, of building a farm, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. We've got to, you know, make sure the soil is right. We have to plant the seeds. We have to water them. There's fertilizing, there's weeding, there's all these things. Um, but the result is that once you've got this going, um, it's producing for you, right? And it's producing a lot for you. And, and this is a method that, um, that we've implemented for ourselves, we implement for a lot of our clients, um, and while it might be a little bit slower to start, the end result is that you have a lot more coming into you. Um, another way to think of this, and, and what they say in the marketing field, is an inbound strategy, right? And so this is, I, I'm going to share with you one method um, that I like to use for this, and, and we'll go from there. So. <clears throat> I like to help people start by, by first choosing a niche market. Um, and, and there's a reason for this. People are more likely to react to a specialist than, than to a generalist. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example of this. Um, I get, you know, I get a lot of requests to join different groups and become, you know, become part of different things. Um, recently, an ad that caught my eye on on LinkedIn was specific to um, female marketing business owners, right? <laughs> and it was it was so specific that it really caught my attention. I was like, wow, there's a there's a specific group for female marketing business owners. Like, I have to check this out, right? Whereas if I were just getting a, I get approached for business owner 
groups all the time and I get approached from marketing groups all the time. And so that, the, the act of getting really specific um, really grabs people's attention. So what does this look like for you? Um, maybe it is a, a campaign that you're doing or content that you're doing specifically for IT directors in, in the medical industry, right? Or maybe it's, um, you know, CEOs with no IT department um, it, in the, uh, that own legal franchises or you know, something like that. But if you can come up with a combination of things that will work well, the, the likelihood it's going to pique someone's interest is much higher than if, if you try to be all things to all people. Uh, so I recommend, you know, if, you're, if you don't have this as part of your marketing strategy, to start with one and then just add others over time, right? And this doesn't mean you have to exclude everybody else. This just means you're, you're developing specialties one at a time. Okay, so the next thing you're going to do once you have this identified is think of who's, who is your largest, most recognized customer within whatever that niche is. Right. And so you can also reverse the steps here and start with, like, who are your largest clients and what are their niches and start focusing there as well. So we're going to approach these these companies and say, hey, uh, we've done such a fabulous job for you. Will you please provide us? Can we do a case study, a video testimonial, some other type of endorsement? Um, and if you the more you have, the better. You know, some some people ask me this question a lot of like, well, how many testimonials do we need? Like, fill the page, right? Like, it's okay if, if people aren't going to read every single word. The fact that you have so many will go a long way to establish some credibility and get people interested in what you have to say. So, um, so we're going to get endorsed by this large company, um, recognizable company within the niche. So now, we're going to take that. We're also going to develop some some messaging specific to the niche. So, um, you know, using the example of healthcare IT professionals, um, how can you demonstrate that you really understand the the specific needs of healthcare IT professionals? So, um, can you create a couple of of landing pages on your site? Can you do a specific collateral piece um, for that? you know, that industry? Can you do some blogging, some, you know, some video contents, anything that, that you can think of to, to let these people know, hey, we really understand your industry. Uh, we know how to serve you. Look, look at these other logos of clients that we've helped within this industry. Um, we can definitely help you. And then you're going to search for this industry's association. So every single industry out there has associations, um, has groups, has conferences. And so we're going to find them. And now that you've got the, you know, your expertise established, uh, we're going to network and we're going to go to become visible within these, these industries. And so um, this might look like volunteering on their committees, speaking on their events, um, offering to blog or contribute articles to their, you know, to their website, uh, participating in their LinkedIn groups, wherever they are, the goal here is that you and your company become the go-to people for IT solutions within this industry, right, this particular industry. And so um, this is not, and this again, remember we're talking farming here, this does not happen overnight. Um, this is not something, and, and I've worked with, with some teams in the past that will go to one event of something and say, well, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't walk away with any leads. Um, that's very short-sighted. <laughs> um, the, the whole idea here is to form a partnership with this, uh, with this industry association. And again, you become the go-to people within this group so that when anybody thinks IT, um, they're thinking of you and what, what you can do to help them. And they're also... You know, you've also now created an army of people who, when they hear people asking about IT, are going to say, hey, I know a guy, right? Uh, you have to talk to these guys like they're great. So you, you've now created a referral partner army here within the industry association. Um, other things you can do here are to, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, leveraging social media and big data. Um, you know, <laughs> big data is scary from a, from a user perspective. 
it's amazing how much these platforms know about us today, right? Um, what Google knows about us, what Facebook knows about us, um, all the social platforms, you know, are just in every second gathering more and more data. Um, and while this is can seem, you know, invasive and scary from a personal standpoint, um, the flip side of the coin is that from a marketing standpoint, we have never been able to target more specifically than we can today. And so if you, you know, if you have, as an example, if you have an email list of potential targets for you, we can upload that email list into various social platforms and have ads show up to only that list. We can also tell um, Facebook, for example, um, take this list and mimic it. Um, show me other people that have the same qualities as this list and let me market to those people, right? And, and you might be rolling your eyes at this point saying, well, Facebook doesn't apply to me, that, you know, that's B2C. Uh, do, not, do not be so fooled. <laughs> um, we, of all the platforms, we only work in B2B tech marketing, and Facebook continues to be our highest performing platform. Um, people are people, right? They don't, they don't stop being a human when they check you know, when they clock in for the day and they put on their IT director hat, like they're, you know, they're humans. And if they see something interesting on their Facebook that's going to relate to their job or help them do their job, they're going to respond to it. Um, keep in mind that everything on the social platforms and within this big data is moving toward a pay to play model. So, um, so you're going to have to spend a little bit of budget there. It's not enough to simply post to LinkedIn or post to Twitter or post to Facebook anymore. Um, you have to put a little bit of budget behind those posts so that we can amplify them and make sure that they're showing up to the right people um, and to enough people to make it worth it. Um, but lots of great stuff happening there on the social networks from a marketing perspective. So implementing these strategies over time, again, you know, kind of choosing one niche and going really deep with it, right? Um, becoming the expert go-to um, IT company for that specific niche and then, and then adding another one. Um, it, is, it is a little bit more of a long-term thing, but it yields so many more results. Um, you get, as I mentioned before, you, you start to create a, a referral army for yourself where not just customers, but just people who know you and have interacted with you are sending referrals your way. There's a lot more trust in your company because you're involved um, in these things. Your sales cycle becomes shorter. Price is a lot less of an issue because you have become the expert go-to people. Um, it's like creating a magnet for yourself, you know, and, and people just will want to work with you if you have demonstrated that expertise and, you know, have built those relationships. Um, so yeah, the principle here is that, you know, think of how, how do we become, how do I become a rock star <laughs> within the different industries uh, that we service? And if you've got, you know, if, if you're really wanting to not pick one, you know, one way to divide this out is if you have multiple sales people is assigning a different sales rep to each industry or association, right? And this way, you can, um, you can cover more ground quicker, right? Um, and this is something that, that I've had success with in the past is saying, okay, um, okay, Joe is focused on the building owners and managers associations, um, and uh, Sally over here is going to be focused on the, on the medical associations, right? Um, and whatever that looks like, you know, have, having one, one or two people focused on that particular that particular industry will ensure that the relationships really are built over time. Um, and this, this method has proven uh, very successful, again, not only for us, but, but for our clients, um, because over time, people just start to know you and come to you with any sort of IT-related question that they have. And with that, that, that kind of covers the, the two methods that I wanted to review with you guys today. Um, I know we're going to open it up for questions in just a second, but if, um, if any of you have any thoughts, again, if you'd like the slides, more than happy to share them with you, um, just shoot me a quick email and I'll, 
and I'll get them over to you. But um, with that, Sarah, have, have any questions come in? Great, thanks, Angela. Uh, we do have one question on the slides, and I believe they can send you an email at Angela at gimmemojo.com, and Angela can share them with everyone. Yep, yeah, more than happy to do that. And the webinar is also being recorded, and the, the recording will be sent out to, to everyone within 24 hours. Great. <clears throat> it looks like there's no questions, Angela. Yeah, I got a I got a shout out. I think thanks, Michael. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it looks like looks like most of the questions. Oh, I had someone say, "Hang on, please." Most of the questions revolve around the slides. So yeah, again, more than happy to send them to you guys. It looks like, Sarah, I don't know if you, if you see that. It looks like Ian has a question. Yep. Um, okay, here we go. So Ian's question is, oh. can you explain the three piece mail sequence in a little more detail, please? Sure. Yeah. So, so we were talking about, um, you know, sending, sending objects in the mail, right, as a way to, um, to get through the noise and, you know, really focus on a list that is very specific. So there's, there's multiple ways that you can do this. Um, you know, in the example I shared about the, about the Rubik's Cube, that was just one piece. Right, but you could come up with a sequence that have three pieces that are related. Um, as an example, uh, for one for one client we did, um, gosh, we I think it was like a, a white. We sent a white glove to, and talked about like white glove service or you know a pair of white gloves. We sent a silver platter and it wasn't real silver, but <laughs> it was uh, you know some some type of fake silver platter, um, but silver platter and talked about, you know, uh, being treated well. And then the last one was like a gift card to, to a restaurant and like joining, joining, asking them to join to, to meet at the restaurant. So, you know, three pieces kind of integrated, woven into a message um, as an example. But, you know, it's interesting. We used to, it used to be that the rule of thumb was that it took you know seven to eight touch points for for someone to respond or to recognize your brand? Um, that was kind of the rule of thumb for marketing back in the day. And because we're so bombarded with things today, that number has increased to be more like eighteen to twenty. So uh, the, one of the biggest mistakes I see that that MSPs and other similar companies make is that they they put all their eggs in this one technique or this one tactic and they they send one thing and they're just hoping this one thing is going to work right when it really just takes a little bit more of a long-term approach and a little more consistency to to make these things happen so the idea behind the the direct mail piece is that yeah if one if one doesn't work you know um, try a sequence and by by that third one, by that third object that they're receiving, like you've definitely, you know, you've definitely made their radar, right? <laughs> you definitely like sparked something, and you know, could follow up with a phone call at that point. So, let's see. It looks like more questions have come in, Sarah. Great. We have a question here that says, "What if you are a small and growing MSP and you are the sales rep with no marketing department?" Yeah, um, that it becomes more challenging, <laughs> right, to do to do these types of things. Um, you know, uh, 
companies that have no, no marketing department um, frequently turn to, you know, turn to a freelancer to help them pull off these types of things or to an agency to help them help them organize all these things. It's really, it's really hard in 2017 to expect a sales rep to manage that entire funnel, right? Um, especially when we see that the marketing has, has really taken over and is now dominating the majority of the sales funnel. So, um, so you know, I, I would encourage you, I'm not sure what, what role um, you're in if, if you're the if you're the owner of the company or if you can get with the owner of the company and just you know talk about like hey can we you know can we talk about working with a freelancer or you know or someone to help us implement some of this marketing stuff so that the salespeople can continue to focus on sales um, you know if if that's not a possibility then I I would go with more of this like farming strategy that I went over here at the end and, and, you know, focus on like, where are your niche, where are your successful niche markets today, right? Like wh where are you successful today? Start there and just put more focus on that and go deeper. Um, you know, try to find that association that local to you that's active for those, you know, for that industry and see if you can get, networked there and got really involved um, and basically turn turn that network into a referral resource for you. Um, if if I were a lone salesperson with no marketing skill or budget, that's what that's how I would focus. So um, it looks Let's like we see. have do we have time for one more question, Angela? Yeah, I think so. Right. Here's, a, here's a good one, a little different. Um, we want to grow our backup plan, but not show, sure how to target our walk-in customers. Any ideas or suggestions on that one? Let's see. We want to grow our backup. I'm not sure I understand what he means by backup plan. Like, like offering the back backup services? Yes, that's what I would I would take from that one. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, so it, I'm not sure how to target the walk-in customers. I mean, I think that um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, you know, one way is just to, you know, go through a battery of questions like with the walk-in customers and, you know, have have some trigger things sort of sort of already pre-decided of like, hey, if, if they mention these things, it's likely that they could be interested in backup. Um, but then another thing could be to just, you know, um, have the backup services be a, a nurture campaign that, that follows, um, you know, meeting with potential new customers. And so if that's something that is a focus of yours, um, but, you, but you didn't talk about it for some reason, um, you know, sending them some content, have you considered backup, like here's, here's some ways to do it, making sure that you're developing some content around those services, and then just you know continually checking in with them is is how I'd approach that. Um, I'm not sure I completely understood the question, but <laughs> I, hope, I hope that was helpful. Great. Well, thank you, Angela. As always, great presentation. Um, a lot of valuable insight into here. So hopefully, a lot of the attendees today were able to to get the the ball rolling with some creative ideas to get their their legion up and running. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah. Always a pleasure to hang out with you guys. And yeah, feel free to shoot me any other questions that you guys have and um, we'll see you next time.